All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Yeshua, come into your divine presence. And we're so excited tonight, Father, as we consider on your word and share the glories of your revelation concerning ourselves in you. We thank you, Father, that you have not saved us from sin and then left us hanging, but you are developing within us an understanding that we may achieve a life that is well-pleasing to you, through your grace, through faith, we can overcome. We thank you, Father, that you give us victory, that you teach us how to obtain victory, that you are the answer and the solution to every situation in life. There is nothing you cannot do, and to him that believeth all things are possible. We receive now the anointing of your Holy Spirit, Upon this, your divine word, that you will instruct us tonight and cause us to leave this place with a shout of victory in you. We ask for the manifestation of your Holy Spirit in divine revelation, in lifting into the heavenlies, and in just wonderful worship of you. We ask it in the name of Yahweh Yeshua HaMashiach and all the people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 25. There used to be times when I said, I have certain scriptures that are my favorites. I think I was stuck on 1 John 4, 17 for 20 years. As he is, so are we in this world. I just love that scripture. Everybody said, what's your favorite scripture? 1 John 4, 17. Man, I just come up with it. That was it. Everybody's got a favorite scripture. And then for a number of years, I had John 8, 32. You'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. That was my favorite scripture. Then for years, I got hung up with... Ezekiel 1, that was my favorite chapter next to Revelation 4. That was my favorite. I could just read it over and 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 I just get excited. I think I've come to the place where I get as charged out of Exodus 25, out of as any scripture in the whole Bible, because I believe this is the pivotal key to all things in the Word. Exodus 25. This is at a point where the children of Israel have been delivered from Egypt. They're standing before Moses. In the wilderness before Mount Sinai. In fact, we need to get the background. Let's look back at verse chapter 24, verse 12. And Yahweh said to Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. And I will give you the tables of stone and the law and the commandment, which I have written that you may teach them. And Moses rose up, Yeshua his minister. Moses went up into the mount of Elohim. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come again to you. Behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a cause, let him come near to them. And Moses went up into the mount, and the cloud covered the mount. Now, if you remember when Yeshua was caught up, what was he caught up into? The cloud. And when he comes again, we're going to be caught up where? Into the cloud. There's no way in the world that anybody can ever go to Yahweh without going into the cloud. See, that, that, that's the beam-me-up chamber, as I've said so many times. See, the cloud is the divine elevator. Hallelujah. Just walk inside and press glory. <laughs> and woo, up you go. So Moses went up into the mountain. The cloud covered the mount. And the glory of Yahweh remained upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the middle of the cloud. And the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like devouring fire. Now, look look at verse 17 here, real close. Uh, Your your translation may not be quite like mine, but it's pretty close. The appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like devouring fire. If, If you... How do you tell somebody, I saw the glory of Yahweh? I mean, how would you describe it? It's devouring fire, isn't it? Devouring... Fire. When he manifests himself, what's the number one sign of manifestation? It's fire. If you just put that in your spiritual pipe, and I don't want to give anybody the chance to say that I'm condoning smoking. And the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses entered into the middle of the cloud. Ooh, hallelujah. And went up. Now, I want you to get that. He went into the middle of the cloud, and then he went up. <laughs> I told you it was an elevator. Hmm? Isn't that right? And went up into the mountain. Moses was in the mount 40 days 
40 nights. Now, while he was up there, he had a conversation. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying... How many of you would like to say, I wish I could hear Father speak to me. Wouldn't that be exciting? I wonder how many of you realize that when you read the next phrase, the reason that we don't hear his voice is he's not going to speak his voice until we hear what he says here. That is his voice. He's already spoken. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, some of you say, well, I didn't get the message. Well, by the tape. Then you go get the tape. He says, oh, I heard the message. Well, you got the tape, right? So you say, I want to hear Father speak. Well, it's been recorded. Here it is right here. It makes no difference whether he said it or you read it. It's the same thing. You follow? In other words, you've got to realize this is it, folks. Let the thing burn. I mean, whether you stood there and heard it or whether you read it, that's exactly what he said. Now, let the thing come alive. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they may take for me an offering. Of every man whose heart makes him willing, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take of them. One dollar bills, five dollar bills, $10 bills, $20 bills, $50 bills, $100 bills, $1,000 bills. How many can see that? Verse 3. Yeah. Only in that day they didn't have a Federal Reserve System, so what they did is in place of it, they brought gold and silver and brass. What did they bring? Gold, silver, brass. Three things, right? Three metals. Gold, silver, brass. Verse 4. And blue and purple and scarlet. How in the world do you bring a blue? <laughs> you ever think about that? Uh, how do you bring a blue? And they brought some blue. Bl bought blue one. But they brought some purple. Didn't say that. I mean, how do you bring blue? How do you bring purple? And they brought some scarlet. And then, besides that, they brought some linen. <laughs> hmm, okay. And then they got some goat's hair. Now, nah, what in the world's goat hair got to do with blue, red, purple, scarlet? And ram skins dyed red, tahash skins and acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, for the sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be set for the ephod for the breastplate. And verse 8, here's the key. Now, with everything you're going to bring me, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, we preached on this a year ago. If you remember, this verse is the absolute key to the entire Bible. Right here. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell. Father cannot dwell where there's not a sanctuary. He is not going to. He cannot. It will not happen. He can only dwell where there is a sanctuary. And the sanctuary has to be made out of only what you offer. You cannot make a sanctuary out of somebody else's material has to be out of something you bring and out of something somebody else brings. And when you take what everybody has offered, that's what you build a sanctuary with. You only build a dwelling place with what's offered. If there's no offering, there's nothing being built to His glory. How many can see that? Whatever you put into the church is all that's going to build the sanctuary. If you don't offer something, nothing is going to be made useful for dwelling. We say, well, I want, I want Father to dwell. Well, the dwelling is going to be based upon what is offered. So you're going to have to bring some gold. You're going to have to bring some silver. You're going to have to bring some brass. You're going to have to bring some blue, some purple, some scarlet, some linen, some skin. Hey, give me some skin. All right. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Verse 9, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furniture, so shall you make it. Now, what he said, I want you to make me a sanctuary. I want you to make it so I can dwell. And I want you to make it according to a pattern. How many know that a dressmaker only makes it according to a pattern? Without a pattern, you cannot make it. There's got to be something that you follow in order to make it. So evidently, Father had given a pattern for something that he wanted done. Right or wrong? So, how many of you would like to dwell, uh, uh, build a sanctuary for the divine indwelling? I mean, do we want the divine indwelling, yes or no? Okay, now, we're not talking about salvation. They'd already been brought out of Egypt. Okay? See, this is where it's so confusing in the church. Get people saved. Well, there's the indwelling. Wrong. You're pulled out of Egypt. You've crossed the Red Sea. You've been singing songs of redemption. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Right? You haven't got no sanctuary. You can be saved. No dwelling. You know why? 
Because wherever He dwells, there is victory. Wherever He dwells, there is the anointing. Sometimes we say, man, I'm doing everything I know how to do, and it's still going wrong. He's not dwelling. Well, why not? Something still needs to be offered. Just think about that for a minute. See where I go with this. I ain't going to preach on money. I can see it now. No, I ain't. I wouldn't do it to a crowd this small. Besides that, all of you are givers. I wouldn't do that. If I had a few takers, I might get on to it. Then it goes into verse 10. Now, verse 10 of Exodus 25, from verse 10 on to the end of the book, is nothing but a divine commandment on the mount where the pattern was given in the cloud to do something on this planet and build a type and shadow facility that will allow Father to come down and dwell temporarily until the day arrives when He can Himself descend into a flesh, blood sanctuary and stay right here on this planet and do away with all wrong. Build me a sanctuary so I can get down there. See, Father can't get into this earth without something to live in. Now, the sanctuary, first of all, had to be something that involved everybody, not one person. See, there is a truth that says, I am the temple, I am the sanctuary, my body is the temple. We know that, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's true. 1 Corinthians 6, my body is the temple, my body is the sanctuary. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Hallelujah, that's glorious. But why are you called the temple? Another scripture says you are a building stone. But a stone without other stones will never make a building. What we should really say, rather than saying you are a temple, we should say you are a temple block. Your structure is no good until it's brought in line with the rest of the structure, which includes the totality of all saved people, which means that my work is to be involved with other people. Does that make sense? See what I'm saying? So there's something for me to do in relationship to some other people. It has to involve otherness to it. Now, as he begins to break this down, the first thing he talks about is the most important thing there is. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. And he begins to give a description of the Ark of the Covenant that is the most important piece of furniture in the entire tabernacle. There is nothing more important than the Ark of the Covenant. Without the Ark of the Covenant, you have no presence. You could have the tabernacle finished. You could have the lampstand. You could have the table of showbread. You could have the altar of incense. You could have the veil with a cherubim on it. But without the Ark, there is nothing happening and Father cannot come down. It is the most important piece of furniture there is. Without the ark, you'll never understand the rest of the Scriptures. And every miracle that Yahweh did in the Old Testament was done around the ark. Wait till you see that later tonight. There's never been a demonstration of power. Israel never had a national victory unless the ark of the covenant was in operation. Never did he ever move apart from the ark. And we know from the types that the ark represents Christ, the second Adam. Now, let's go down to verse 17. From 10 to 17, it describes the ark in itself. Verse 17 begins something that you add to the ark. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubics and a half shall be the length of it, and a cubic and a half the width of it. Now, verse 18 to verse 20, you need to underline. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Who's going to make the cherubim of gold? Who's the you? Who's going to make the cherubim? I mean, do you know that cherubim have to be made? Huh? They have to be made. And where are they placed when they're made? You shall make two cherubim of gold. How many? Two. And they're going to be made of what? Gold. Now, he said, build me a sanctuary that I can come and dwell. What was the first thing he told them to bring in their offerings? Gold. Gold. But what do you want with the gold? Make a mercy seat. Can't make mercy seat without gold. Isn't that amazing? Mercy cannot be made out of wood. Mercy cannot be made out of brass. Mercy cannot be made out of silver. Nowhere in the Bible is mercy ever found apart from gold. How many know that the best gold was in the Garden of Eden? Finest gold in the land. 
How many know that the city is made of what? Streets of gold. The city itself is made of gold. Made of gold. It's made of gold. Where did the gold come from? It came from the offerers. It come from the people. What you put in is what is going to become. And if you don't have anything becoming, it's because there's nothing being put in. So evidently the gold that's here, although a lot of preachers would like to use this as money, and, and it, at the beginning it took money because without gold, it couldn't be built. And gold is a commodity, a value system. But it's not just speaking about money, it's also speaking about a value system. Where is your value? Where is your priority? What is the most important thing to you? Your life? Your car? Your clothes? Your job? Your family? That's not gold, folks. You have to offer up gold before there can be a mercy seat. Is that exciting? I know some of you are still trying to figure out, where is he going with this? And at first it may sound like a, it's kind of a negative. Oh, no, it's a total positive. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of beaten work shall you make them. How do you make cherubim? Beat them around. That's it. You got it. Beat them. Beat them. You ever feel beaten? You ever been beat up? Somebody's mouth just bam, 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 zap you down. No matter you try to share something with somebody and they just get so mad at you because you try to share it. You're beaten. You say, what's going on? Well, you see, you offered up the goal. You've yielded to the divine word in your life and you're becoming obedient to Him. And as you become obedient to Him and you bring it into the world system, it'll beat you. It'll attack you. It'll oppose you. Every time you make a stand for the word, there'll be somebody who'll tell you, you're in sin. You're wrong. It ain't going to work. How many of you ever noticed that? Every time you honestly try to say something, somebody's ready to beat you in the tubes over it. And they don't even know. They, you know, it's amazing the attitudes that's out there. I mean, can you imagine Christ acting like that? Would you expect Christ to tell you what you hear some of your fellow Christians tell you? He wouldn't do it, would he? And you say, I wouldn't even do that. All of a sudden, you begin to sense there's a difference between me and you. That's what Father's trying to get you to see. Instead of being beaten down when you're beaten, you're supposed to be beaten up. Now, I know it's bad to be beaten up because beaten up in the world sense means you're destroyed. But that's not what I'm talking about. To be destroyed in the world is to be beaten down. But to be beaten up means I'm taking the beating and it's producing something in me that's making me stand up. See, it's easy to say, okay, have it your way. It's not worth the argument. But when you have a value system, you're saying the truth that I'm standing to and that I'm committed to and that I'm offering to Him, my time on the Sabbath, I'm offering my money to build the church, I'm offering my car to do something with it here for the, for the Master, I'm offering up time for this. I'm offering up part of my house at times for this. I I'm offering this to you. So that's just stupid. You better just stop it. You're just, you're, you're, it's no good. It's not going to... Hallelujah, you're being beaten up. You're, getting, you're, you're being formed into a chair. Yeah. Let that sink in for a minute. Beaten work shall you make them. And there's no way to become a cherubim without being beaten up. Hallelujah. And it's at the two ends of the mercy seat. Now, if you're going to be a cherub, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to be placed on the mercy seat because there is no cherubic activity apart from the mercy seat. And you notice the first thing you've got to learn how to do is have mercy for those that are judgmental. Hmm. You make one cherub at one end of the mercy seat, one cherub at the other end of the mercy seat. One piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on the two ends of it. Now, it kind of repeats itself redundantly three times. It's trying to emphasize something. You're going to make two. You're going to put one on one side of the mercy seat. You're going to put the one on the other side of the mercy seat, but make sure it's made out of the mercy seat so that the cherubim and the mercy seat are of the same material, of the same piece, and you cannot see where the mercy seat ends and the cherubim begins. I'm part of the mercy seat. That's what I am. A cherubim is part of the mercy seat. What in the world is the mercy seat? And I thought you'd never ask. Verse 20. Well, aren't you going to tell us? In a minute. And the cherubim shall spread out their wings on high. Now, if I was Moses, with the education that I've had, and I heard Yahweh say, when you make your cherubim, I want you to spread their wings out. I'd say, what wings? What, are, what do you mean, wings? How do you make cherubim with wings? I mean, I know birds have wings. Why do cherubim have wings? First thing he emphasizes is that cherubim have wings. Okay. They're made of gold, 
But the first thing he emphasizes about cherubim is they got wings. Now, the wings, what are they made of? Gold. Okay. But the wings kind of overshadow the cherubim themselves. The, the emphasis is on wings. Now, there's nothing worse than going to a barbecue chicken roast out, and there's nothing, sir, but barbecue chicken wings. I like legs. Some people, they like wings. Well, Father likes wings. He loves cherub wings. He loves them. They're very important to him. Well, wings don't have no value to me. Well, then we got to line up and figure out how come they have no value to me when they have all the value to him. Israel's out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They got problems. Father says, I need to dwell. But before I can dwell, here's the most important piece of material that you can make. Get your finest gold, beat it, make a mercy seat, put cherubim on the end, and make sure that their wings are spread out. I want their wings hidden under their arms. I want their wings spread out. How many know that a wing spread means it's ready for flight? And covering the mercy seat with their wings. I don't want, in other words, when I look down, I don't want to see the mercy seat, I want to see wings. The wings cover the mercy seat, comma, with their faces to one another. Now, the only thing it talks about is wings and faces. That's it. Just wings and faces. Right? Wings and faces. And their face has got to be looking at each other. So the cherub on one side of this altar is looking at the cherub on the other side of the altar. Right? They're looking at each other. Their faces are facing each other. Their wings are overshadowing the mercy seat and the ark. But their faces are looking one toward another. And they're looking towards the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubim be. So not only are they facing each other, but they're also looking down at the mercy seat. Their eyes are on the mercy seat. And, verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you, which was the Ten Commandments. How many know the testimony here is the Ten Commandments? How many know there's only one way to testify to the Father? We're living epistles read of all men. We testify of Him. What does it mean to testify? To declare His commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, we're under law. No, because you can't be saved by law. Law will never save you. But grace is going to deliver you from sin. Now, if you're not supposed to sin, then that must mean you've got to keep the law because sin is breaking the law. So you can't get away from it. But it's in grace that we keep the law, not under law. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Now look at verse 22. And there I will meet with you. There's only one place Father will ever meet with anybody. That's at the mercy seat between the cherubim. I'm going to say that again. There's only one place that Father will ever meet anybody. It is only at the mercy seat and only between the cherubim. Where will Father meet us? At the mercy seat and between the cherubim. One more time. If Father is going to meet with you, where is He going to meet you with? Where? At the mercy seat between the cherubim. That's an eternal law, folks. You personally will never meet Him without that. No one in your family will ever do it. The church will never do it. The world will never see it until we get together in this one act right here. There's only one way, and that's what He's trying to tell you. And that's why Christ said, I am the way. I will commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Now, the Father is between the cherubim, above the mercy seat, over the ark that contains the commandments. Did you get the picture? Father is between the cherubim, Above the mercy seat, on top of the ark, which contains the commandments. Is that what it says? Yes or no? Look it up in any commentary. I don't care what denomination it is. Jewish, Protestant, or Catholic. Same thing. You have to agree, folks. Ain't no disagreement here. That's what it says. Nobody disagrees with it. Every major religion that bases anything on this book is going to tell you that's exactly the way it is. How do we lose all the purpose to it? How do we lose all the... Meaning to it, if that's the case. I'm not going to preach on it tonight, but let's just jump over a page to chapter 26, verse 1. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twine linen, 
and blue and purple and scarlet with what? Cherubim. The work of the skillful workman. You shall make them. Again, what do you do with cherubim? You make them. Got that? How do you make them? With the work of a skillful workman. Got to find somebody that's skilled in working needlework. First, you got cherubim made out of gold. Now, we got a veil of fine white linen with some blue put on it and some purple put on it and some scarlet put on it. And in the white and the blue and the scarlet and the purple, which if you mix it together, you get red, white, and blue. <clears throat> okay. When you put them together, you end up with cherubim. Well, the only place you find cherubim, anywhere in this book, anywhere in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is only in the Holy of Holies, on top of the ark, on the mercy seat, connected to it in gold, and on the veil, intertwined with fine linen, blue, purple, and scarlet. Only place. Only place. And it's required before Father can dwell. Now, so far, have I twisted anything or is that what it says? Yes or no? Now, I'm trying to emphasize something to you. Whenever you talk about cherubim, there's only two places you will ever find them. In the Holy of Holies and in the veil going into the Holy of Holies. Only two places you'll ever find them. Which means they are connected. They are the way into the Holy of Holies. And they are the only thing in the Holy of Holies by which... Father will communicate with anyone on this planet. Let me give you an example. Anybody here have an unsaved loved one in your home? Somebody or maybe somebody that's not living right? Now, they're not trusting the Savior. They don't believe in the blood of the Lamb. Do they have access to the Father? No. I don't care how religious they are. Do they have access to the Father? Remember what he said? If you do not build me this pattern, I cannot dwell. I'm only going to meet you. Where? Between the wings of the cherubim and... At the mercy seat. It's the only place he's going to meet. Now, you know, they're not there. They're not there. But if you're there, then you become the voice of Yahweh to them. Now, how would you want that voice to sound like? You now become the testimony to them. But see, we're not yet in a place where I want to represent the indwelling to the unsaved. See, I'm the mercy. See, fo folks, in, unless we move in mercy towards the un unbelievers, because it's, it's awful easy to forget that we were once unbelievers, and we were once obnoxious, and those who are unsaved are still obnoxious, especially those in our family. And you know what they need? They need mercy. But I, it's so easy to give them my wrath. It's so easy to get my feelings hurt. But if you are beaten up in the gold of the mercy seat then I'm not going to let anything personally get to me. I'm going to become the voice of Father because He's in me, and I'm just going to let Him speak to them whatever He wants to say. <laughs> now, they may not like what Father has to say to them, but you've got to be the willing vessel <laughs> to offer up your mouth to say what Father wants them to hear. Now, the question is, are you willing to tell them what Father is wanting to say to them since you are the only mouthpiece that's there at the time? You say to yourself, Father, why don't you talk to them? He says, I'm trying to, but you won't open your mouth. Or if you do open your mouth, you won't put it in the Spirit. We like to just look at them and say, You're going to hell now. Leave me alone. Now, that ain't the way you testify. <laughs> That's the easy way to do it. So I, I figured that since this is the most important Scripture and we need to understand Exodus 25, where in the world did all this cherubim stuff start in the first place? Well, let's go back to Genesis and see if we can find out. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Genesis 3, verse 22. Always go back to the first reference of a thing and find out where it starts, and that'll tell you where to start. How many know if you want to understand a novel, you usually start on page 1? Otherwise, well, who is the butler? He's butlering where? Whose butler is he? Don't start at the end of the book, folks. Start at the beginning. How many know what the book of Genesis means? Book of Beginnings. Well, let's find the beginning of a cherubim. Genesis 3.22 And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good 
and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the what? Tree of life. And if he eats this tree of life, he will what? Live forever. If he eats, if he gets a hold of what's on the tree of life, was there a tree of life in the garden? There was. If he took that tree, would he have lived forever? Had he committed sin? Did he know evil? Then he would have known evil forever, wouldn't he? So that was mercy that put him out of the garden. Huh? Yeah, we usually look at it the other way around, don't we? It was mercy that put him out of the garden. Huh? Let he eat of the tree of life that's in the garden. How many know the tree of life has never been moved out of the garden? Nowhere does the Bible say that the tree of life was ever transferred to another garden. Tree of life is still in the garden. Now, how many remember when Christ hung on a tree? He said something profound to the thief on the cross. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, where do you find a pair of dice? Probably in Vegas, right? Well, it's not that kind of dice, folks. Paradise is the same word as Garden of Eden in the Hebrew. Same word. Now, I just, just leave it in Hebrew. Today thou shalt be with me in the Garden of Eden. Do you suppose Christ is the tree of life? Anyway... Just in case he eats this tree of life and lives forever, we're going to have to put him out. So now look at verse 23. Therefore Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. So he drove out the man in a Plymouth. No, it wasn't a Cadillac. It was a Plymouth because, you see, he was driven out in fury. Okay. I know. i got to get your interest back once in a while. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, what? Cherubim. He placed them there. What did he do that for, and who were they? And now, where, where do we find the cherubim? Over the mercy seat and part of the mercy seat, right? That was mercy that drove him out of the garden, okay? So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim, and what else? Flaming sword. Now, how many know that if you have the armor of Yahweh on, what is in your hand? A sword. But when you walk into Yahweh, His appearance is like a fire. Flaming fire. Did not His Word burn in our heart? His Word is a flaming sword. When you disobey His Word, it will separate you. But what Father has put between you and Him is a mercy seat cherubim between every sinner and every sin and the Father is a cherubim mercy seat. Now, because of that, I've said for years, since the cherubim were at the east side of the gates, that's where the temple was in the garden. That the Garden of Eden was the holy of holies. Adam was the high priest, the Melchizedek, the king priest of the entire world before he sinned. And the race that came from this great man was to rule the world. But our first man, Adam, father, got kicked out of his rule. And now our race has fallen. So the first thing Christ has to do is the second Adam is to redeem, first of all, the race. So we can go back and do what we were supposed to have done in the first place. But you can't get back in until you can get by the cherubim. Because if you're going to meet Father, you got to go where? Between the cherubim on the mercies. Now some of this is going to start coming home to you after a while. I mean, I've been preaching on this for years. But somewhere it's going to... Oh, that's what he's been saying. Oh, yeah, it's good stuff, folks. I'm giving you some meat. I'm trying to break it down. I'm marinating it. Cutting it up. Seasoning it. Spoon feeding it into you with a little bit of stew sauce. Now, Leslie called me up the other night. You know, I had known, because I had a revelation on it, that the Garden of Eden was the Holy of Holies. It was a cube. 
And that's where the cherubim were. And he was kicked out of the Holy of Holies. And the only person ever allowed in the Holy of Holies any time in the history of the ark, in the history of the temple, was the high priest, right or wrong? The only person ever, no priest could ever get into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest. Now, Christ is our high priest, and he entered in once and for all. And he's representing you and me, and we are all now divinely appointed high priests. That's our calling. That's our function. But I've got to get past the cherubim. But in order to get past them, I've got to first of all become like them so I can become them. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the flame of a sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now it doesn't say here that he kept, kept them out of the garden. It said, I always thought that he kept them out of the garden. It does not say that. It said he kept them from the way of the tree of life. He kept them from the way. Christ said what? I am the way. What? I am the way to the tree of life. And what's the word for life? Zoe. Okay. What's the name of the cherubim? Now, that was Sabbath. I preached a whole hour and a half on it. The name of the cherubim, I gave it to you on Sabbath. Wrote it right up here, three letters. Did it last Wednesday night also, three letters. Zoe! All right! Hey! Les called me up and he says, Hey, I found that reference in the book of Jubilees. I said, You did? He said, Yeah. I said, Where at? He said, Chapter 8. I went and looked it up. And I said, Well, I'll be... Here's what I preached, and here's confirmation of it. Didn't know it was here. Book of Jubilees, chapter 8, verse 18, last half of 18, and verse 19. This was a, a promise after uh, Ham had gone in and discovered Noah, and he come out, and he gives the curse and the blessings upon the three sons of Noah. And he came over and he said to Shem, Blessed be Yahweh, Elohim of Shem, and may Yahweh dwell in the dwelling of Shem. Now get that now. And may Yahweh... Dwell. Now, what was the one thing he wanted to do? Dwell. Build me a sanctuary that I may dwell. Bring me some gold. And I'm going to dwell between the cherub on the mercy seat. Right? Well, this says in Jubilee. Now, this was written before Christ. And may Yahweh dwell in the dwelling of Shem. Who are the Shemites? From Shemite, we get Semite. So if you are anti-Semite, you are anti-Shemite or anti-dwelling. Now, if anybody ever calls you an anti-Semite, you can say, you're wrong. I am for Shem. I'm a Shemite because I am for the dwelling. May Yahweh dwell in the tent of Shem. Now, when somebody says they're Shemite, ask them, where's the dwelling? Where's the mercy seat? Where's the cherubim? You might find out that some Shemites aren't Shemites. And you might find some people who aren't Shemites, who think they aren't, are. To be an anti-Semite is to be an anti-temple lover. That's what an anti-Semite is. So when you find somebody who doesn't believe in Messiah and hates him, you've got an anti-Semite. So when he calls you an anti-Semite, you've got grounds now. It's in his own book, the book of Jubilees. And he knew, that is Shem, that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies. Oh, hallelujah. And the dwelling of Yahweh. Now, how many know that Father Yahweh, the Creator, walked in the midst of the Garden? And in evening time, He would come and talk with Adam. You know what it says? In the cool of the evening. Now, the evening was when? When was the, what happened at evening time in Hebrew days? It was the end of one day and the beginning of the next, right? As he would end the day and begin the day, right in the cool of the evening, Yahweh would always come and meet him at the end and at the beginning. I'm the what? Alpha and Omega. Now, when you folks learn how to put him first and last, you wake up with Father, you go to bed with Father, what you do in between, you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't defy Father, but you better make sure you spend some time with Father in the eve. May I tell you, don't go to bed until you've had some time with Father. Let the last thing you think about be Father. When you wake up in the morning, let the first thing you think about be Father. That's easy to think about other things when you go to bed. Like the fight you just had. Like the bills you just couldn't pay. It's, a, it's, it's real easy 
But don't get in the habit. You, you see, I, I want to return to the Garden of Eden. I want to live its lifestyle. I like the lifestyle of Eden. I don't know about you, but I like the lifestyle of Eden. You know, the word Eden means garden of pleasure. That's what it means, garden of pleasure. It literally means the pleasure house of Yahweh. Mm, 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 mm. Pleasures of Yahweh. There is joy forevermore at His right hand, right? Pleasure. Pleasure. See, now, the world's it's got its pleasures. And you know why they look so good and they're so tantalizing? Because we've never had a vision of the real pleasure. When you see the real pleasure, that pleasure just kind of falls off. Basically, that's what marriage is all about. You know, everybody dates everybody until one day you, this one person above everybody else sparks you. All of a sudden, you just can't take your eyes off of one person. Somebody says, well, can I date you? I ain't interested. Now, there's some guys, they date three women at one time, wouldn't bother them at all. But if this guy's in love with this woman, he could care less about the other two. Because love has sparked him, and he now makes a distinction. And when you learn to love the things of Father, now what it says in 1 John 2, 15, 16, love not the world, love the Father. If you love the Father, you'll not love the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And no man can serve what? Two masters. You're going to master something. You are a master of either a lover of Yahweh or a lover of the world. You will master one of those two. Or it will master you. Paul said in the last days there will be people who will be lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of Yahweh. Washington is not do you have a love of pleasure. Everybody does. It's built into the fallen flesh. But when you make a choice to not give in to that pleasure for the greater pleasure of Yahweh's will, then you've made a choice to love Yahweh above the world. And that is the offering of gold. And that's what Father will begin to build mercy out of. Hallelujah. Okay? Anyway, I just wanted to call your attention to it. Let me finish reading the whole verse. I'd love to, I'd love to preach on this verse. But don't have the time. Blessed be Yahweh Elohim of Shem, and may Yahweh dwell in the dwelling of Shem. And he knew that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies and the dwelling of Yahweh. And Mount Sinai, the center of the desert. And Mount Zion, the center of the navel of the earth. These three were created as holy places facing each other. Boy, that's an interesting phrase. I'd love to spend time on that. There's three places that Father dwelt. One was the Garden of Eden, the other was Sinai, and the other one was Mount Zion. Now, this was before Christ. But Mount Zion was called the center of the navel of the earth. The center of the navel. How many knew that earth had a navel? Huh? Makes no difference. The ancient Hebrews believed that the Holy of Holies was the navel where Yahweh reached through and streams of living water gushed out to nourish the earth. It was called the navel. It was based in the Holy of Holies. The Greeks took it over and their oracle centers were called navels. That's what an oracle center was. A navel, the center where the deity spoke. And they had seven of them. In Greece, these seven naval centers were all separated by the same degrees that we now have in music. How they know that stuff back then? The same vibratory rate that separates A from B and C in the sound range, they were separated by miles. And if you were to look down by a plane, you'd see the octave of oracle centers or the rainbow. wonder where they got that. Well, that's not for tonight. Just thought I'd mention that. Now, let's take a fast glance, glimpse at what we've talked about so far. We have what? The floor plan of the tabernacle. Here's the outer court, right? Here's the holy place. There's the veil where the cherubim were. And here's the Ark of the Covenant upon which was placed the cherubim of glory between which Yahweh sat, right? Here's another picture. The Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. There's the veil, separating the holy place from the holy of holies. Here's a bird's eye view of the holy place. There's the lampstand. There's the table of showbread. There's the altar of incense. Here's the veil of cherubim. Now, again, I, I'll make the statement. There were not three. This picture shows three. There were four. It only shows three here, but it gives you the example that when every priest came in, he couldn't go past what? Couldn't go past the cherubim, could he? Same as the Garden of Eden. What's he trying to tell you? There's the Garden of Eden, folks. 
There's the Garden of Eden. If you could ever get through that veil, you're in the Garden again. Ooh, hallelujah. What separates you from the tree of life? The cherubim. You get past those cherubim. Now, once a year, the high priest could go past those cherubs, right? But only the high priest. And that, not without blood, right? And that day was called what? Day of Atonement, known as Yom Kippur. The sixth feast of Israel. The day when you got a chance to go beyond the veil. To go past the flaming sword and go past the cherub and enter and be able to touch the tree of life. But only the high priest and only once a year. And then only with pure blood. Hmm. Now, wait till we get to the feast of the Day of Atonement, folks. We're going to have some fun. You see, you see, you're not going to understand any one of these truths until you understand all of them. Because it's all of them together. The offerings, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, the priesthood, the prophetic out, they all go together. Can you see that? Okay. Here's another overhead of the cherubim with a priest officiating in the holy place. Here's another picture of the cherubim of glory. Here you see two of them in the veil. Everybody's trying to figure out what the priest saw when he went into the veil. Here's another one. Everybody's got an example, but they all miss it to a certain degree. Okay? Now, let me put back here what we had on Sabbath. Here we notice there's four colors. Purple, scarlet, white, and blue. The four colors of the veil of the tabernacle, right? Four colors. Now, the cherubim were woven on to the four colors, right? And that there were four. How many cherubim? Four. How many faces? Four. How many colors? Four. How many gospels? Four. And all of them were summed up in one word. Zoe. He that hath the Son hath Zoe. Now, how many know that a baby is born with life, but it is not living? How many know that? Now, let that sink in for a minute. Every baby is born living or alive. It has life. It is not living. Living is when you can use that life in its totality in the usefulness of every drive you have, in every ability you have to arrive at the full expression and desire of your nature to succeed before Father. How many of you are doing everything you want to do? Of course not. See? The word Zoe means... Beings in whom is the fullness of life. Yeshua said in John 10.10, 10, The devil, the thief, comes to destroy. What's he going to destroy? Life. He's going to steal. What's he going to steal? Life. He's going to come to kill. What's he going to kill? Life. But I have come that you might have Zoe and have it more of. Now, you get life when you get born again. Is that the end? No, that's the beginning, folks. You are not yet where He wants you until you are at a place where you're having a ball in this life. Where you wake up every morning, Woo! I'm partying! And you go to bed every night, Woo! I'm partying! I mean, all day long, it's a party with Yahweh. Walking in the cool of the evening with Father Yahweh. Enoch walked with Yahweh, and he was not, for Yahweh took him. He says, I, I won't leave you down there anymore. Come on up here with me. <laughs> I'm enjoying that. I, I don't want to just walk down there with you once in a while. I want you to be with me all the time. Come on up here where there's no more limitation. Come up here where there's no more sorrow. Come on up here where there's no more sickness. Come up here where there's no more sin. Come up here where there's nobody that will misunderstand you. Come up here where there's never another need. Where there's never another a tear. Where there's never another problem. Come on up here with me where we're going to have a party forever. Oh, how I can handle that. I don't know about you, but I can handle that. But most Christians can't understand. That's what Father wants right here. Huh? How many of you are that happy? Uh-huh. I ain't got this problem. Uh, oh, man, pray for me. I ain't going to make it through the day. I may know there's people that could be here tonight. I ain't. I know some people can't help it, but some of them could. And the devil cheated them because he wants to steal 
your life. And the only way He can do it is take you from the flaming sword. Because unless you let that flaming sword burn in your heart until His Word comes alive, you'll never get any closer to Him than you allow the Word to burn inside of you. And you're only going to get it under the anointing. If I deliver it under the anointing, and you receive it under the anointing, you are going to receive the anointing and the burning. And you're going to be cleansed and healed. If I speak it under the anointing and you don't receive it under the anointing, it is going to have no value to you and nothing will happen. And if I preach it without the anointing and you have the anointing, you'll still receive the anointing. But if I preach it without the anointing and you don't have the anointing, we're both clanging simple. Four ways to preach the Word, folks. And it isn't just preaching, it's hearing as well. My anointing, in one sense of the Word, is contingent upon yours. And if you don't come prayed up, opened up, it's hard for me to offer up. There must be oneness in the midst of us. Can you see that? One spirit, one mind. Father lays a burden upon me. He lays a message upon me. He gives me the anointing. I come here, and what happens in this assembly is totally based on the attitude and receptivity of this people. Moses alone could not lead the children of Israel, although he was its chosen leader. He had to have... Aaron, his brother, hold up one arm, and her hold up the other arm, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the activity of the high priest Yeshua on the heavenly side, four intercessors at all times in the task of a leader. Who are the priests in this church who are holding up this arm? Who in this church is saying, Pastor, I'm behind your message, I'm behind your vision, I'm behind your burden. I hurt when you hurt, and I rejoice when you rejoice. Then you have unity. It's not whether I line up with the congregation. It's whether the congregation lines up with me. And what you need to pray for is that I'm lined up with Yahweh. How many got that? If I'm lined up with Yahweh and you're lined up with me, Father is going to dwell. We're going to form the link of gold that's going to beat this mercy seat until this church becomes a mercy seat and the means of letting Father out into our circumstances, into our families, and into this neighborhood. You got the picture? Now, let's take a look at some interesting scripture. Let's turn to the book of Numbers. Oh, my word, time is already gone, isn't it? Let me just quickly go through this and we'll close then. Number seven. Number seven. I've got to give you this. Number seven. Verse 89. Number seven, verse 89. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him... Then he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, and he spoke to him. How many can see that? Would you underline that in your Bible and take it home with you tonight and just meditate on that? Would you do that? Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. When Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him, then he heard the voice. If you want to hear his voice, this is the only way you will ever hear the voice. It will be above the mercy seat that's upon the ark of the testimony or the commandments and from between the two cherubims. And that's the only time he'll speak to you. Well, good scripture, but I'm not too sure I agree with you. Okay, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Mouth of two or more witnesses, let my word be established. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh and they brought from there the ark of the covenant of Yahweh of hope. What a word. I love that. Hallelujah. And they brought the ark of the covenant of Yahweh of hosts, who sits above the cherubim. Where does Yahweh sit? Above the cherubim or between the cherubim? Now, is the word above in italics there? Some Bibles it is. I wonder what the real Hebrew says right there. Well, we're going to find out in a minute. Let's go to 2 Samuel. Chapter 6, 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 2. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baali Yehuda to bring up from there the ark of Elohim, which is called by the name. Ooh, hallelujah. He brought the ark. He brought the ark of Elohim, which is called... By the name. Now, the emphasis there is on the. 
The ark is called the name. Okay? Even the name of Yahweh of hosts that sits above the cherubim. Well, it's getting sound better, but I'm not too sure you're all there. Okay, let's go to Psalms 80. There's a lot more, folks. I'm just giving you a couple because we don't have much time. Psalms 80, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you that lead... Who? Joseph. Well, I know where Judah is. Who's Joseph? Now, I know the signs of Joseph. Joseph, it's 13 olive berries and 13 arrows in the paws of an eagle. Kind of looks like that great seal of the United States back there. <laughs> Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you that lead Joseph, the Joseph people, the USA people, like a flock. You that sit above the cherubim, shine forth, shine forth. Hebrew, Shekinah. Let the glory of your majesty just come down. Rain your nature on my problem. Shine on my disease and it'll no longer be. Shine on my weakness and it'll be gone. Shine on death and there'll be a resurrection. Shine on my empty pocketbook and it'll be filled with much supply. How? Oh. Eve, it sits between the cherubim. Well, you're getting close. Okay, Psalms 99. Verse 1. I love this one. It's my second favorite scripture now. Yahweh reigns. Ooh. How many of you can say that? And my landlord still reigns. Channel 7 still reigns. President Bush still reigns. Gorbachev still reigns. My car still reigns. My husband still reigns. <laughs> Wrong. Yahweh reigns. Let the people tremble. He sits. Now, how, where does he reign? He reigns from where he sits, right? So you're not going to see his reign unless you know where he's sitting and go and kneel at his throne. He sits above the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. You want to move something, move the earth. Don't move Yahweh. Now, the Hebrew in the original, in the verb, hasn't got a thing to do with in between or above or below. The Hebrew simply says, the indwelling. He who indwells the cherubim. He who indwells the cherubim. How many know that when Yeshua was born in Matthew 1, 21, it says, Thou shalt call his name Yeshua? But right after that it says, And thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Right? Emmanuel, meaning Elohim or Yahweh, with us or in us. Now what did he say? Build me a sanctuary that I may dwell in you where I can reign. Where I can unleash my power. Where I can unload my arsenal. Where I can shine and destroy every enemy. Now, isn't that where every Christian wants to be? Why do you think you're redeemed? You were redeemed just to get to that place. His job is to bring you into that place. That's the final resting place in the promised land. And you're supposed to go into the land and who says it? Yahweh wants to reign in your life here and now before you get to heaven. <coughs> But you've got to take the gold and you've got to beat it. Now, last scripture, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, forget it, let's go to chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. Revelation 5, verse 6. And I saw in the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures, the cherubim or the zoe in the Greek, and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as though it had been killed, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of Yahweh sent forth into all the earth. And he came and he takes it, the book, out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals of it, for you were killed and did purchase to Yahweh with your blood of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made them to be to our Elohim a kingdom of priests and they reign upon the earth. 
And that's that translation. The Greek, the original, literally says, Thou hast made us a kingdom of priests. You have redeemed us by thy blood. But who are those four living creatures? The redeemed who enter in to the fullness. What I want to introduce to you is how do we get into the fullness where I can start to feed off of that tree of life. How many of you remember what Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 24? He that believeth in me shall, shall never die. He that believeth in me shall never die. Never. Well, how many of you know Christians who die? Well, that must not be what that verse means. Because everybody who believes in him has been dying. See, we're so narrow-minded, we can't see what the word life there means. How many know that your greatest problem in mine is what you and I are conscious of at the moment we're going through it? Huh? I'm conscious of sorrow. I'm conscious of hurt. I'm conscious of pain. I'm conscious of lack. I'm conscious of all kinds of things. And the Bible just simply says it doesn't have life on it. If it has life, you don't have the problem. He that believeth on me shall never die. Here's what he's trying to say. Same thing he told the woman at the well. I have water to give you that if you will drink it, you will never thirst again. Who's he talking to? Earth Christians. You will reach a place where your consciousness is so indwelt by the divine Shekinah, the glory, that he will rest in you. You're so filled with the divine presence that even if you were to lay this body down, your consciousness will continue to walk with Father from this hour on. You'll never lose that conscious walk with the Father. Now let that sink in for a minute, because some of you still didn't get that. I saw that in the Spirit. Some of you did not get that at all. It starts here and now, where you can walk in the divine consciousness and overcome your problems. You are to be an overcomer. He that overcometh all things, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. It's promised to everybody. You, you do that right down here, folks. You don't do that up there. You do that right down here. You overcome here. You don't overcome when you're over there. You're already an overcomer. You overcome down here. But to those who overcome, all of a sudden, let's say that the second coming isn't here yet. The resurrection hasn't arrived. Your body lays down, right? Your consciousness, who you are, is like your conscious right now. That consciousness will never change. You're conscious of the Father in the body, and all of a sudden you're conscious of the Father outside of the body. You make a transition. Don't even know you've made the transition. Your body lays down, and your soul leaps out. And you just continue walking with Him, and you stay with Him until it's time for the resurrection, and then you come back and pick up the body again, and never to be separated from the body. I don't know about you, but that's glorious. You know how many saints there are that lay on their deathbed? And while they're looking at all their loved ones, all of a sudden they'll say, I see angels filling this room. Ha! Yeshua! Ah, yes! And their arms go up, and their head goes back. And a smile is on their face. And if you had your eyes open, you'd just see their inner body just reach up out of that external body, and they hold hands with the Savior, and on they go to paradise where they await the resurrection. But some of us aren't going to go that way, folks. Some of us are going to be alive when He comes again. And we're going to stay in this body and He's just going to go ahead and resurrect it while I'm in it. And I'm still never going to lose the consciousness of Father. With or without this body, me and Father are going on. Hallelujah. But the emphasis is, folks, don't wait until the body is changed or gold. Learn how to walk with Him before. Put on the four faces. Learn it well. Learn to yield to the Holy Spirit. Qualify every thought until it begins to become a lion face, an ox face, an eagle face, or a man face. The four kings. You were designed to be king. How many know that in a deck of cards, there's four kings? How many knew that? How many knew that those four kings in that deck of cards was taken out of the book of Ezekiel? Today, they're used for tarot cards. Boy, has the devil perverted a lot of things along the way. <laughs> they originally, those four kings, referred to the four powers of this life. The ability to put on the face of Christ. Until I overcame 
You know what? It just dawned on me. I didn't tell you what the mercy seat was. It's only one scripture. First John chapter two. Let's read it together and find out what the mercy seat is. First John chapter two. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father and Yeshua, the Messiah, the righteous one. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And he is the propitiation for our sins. How many here have propitiation in their Bibles? How many have something else? Anybody here have something else besides propitiation? Expiation? What else? Who else? Something else? Huh? What is it? Atoning sacrifice? Okay. What else? Anybody else have anything else? That's it? Do you know what the word is there? Mercy. 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 He is the propitiatory, which means to propitiate or to make atonement or to do away with the judgment of sin. He's the one that does away with judgment. He's the one that brings in mercy. Instead of you having to pay for your weaknesses, you are forgiven, cleansed, restored, made whole, and loosed into the spirit of righteousness to be an overcomer. He is your mercy seat. And if you want to be a cherubic overcomer, you must become a part of the mercy seat and He will only indwell in that propitiatory of which Christ alone is, which means there is nothing that will ever take place in your life outside of Christ. He must become the all. It is all of grace. It is all of faith. No self-effort, no flesh involved. And how dare people say, I teach law. How many heard what I just said? We're saved by grace alone through faith and that perpetually through the blood of the Lamb, the only atonement. But when you become a part of the sacrifice, you become a part of the seat and then you become part of the indwelling and then you become part of the cherubim. The cherubim is an office waiting for fulfillment. You start in the book of Revelation as Adam is kicked out and they end in the book of Revelation where man is brought in. And after all the judgments are poured out, finally says there's a new heaven, there's a new earth, and now they shall say, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men. The sanctuary is with men. The indwelling is with men. No more war. No more struggle. But until that day, folks, we are the only sanctuary on this earth. In your home, you may be the only mercy seat in that home. Don't let the devil play games with you and discourage you. Stand up and be counted. Lay hold of the altar. So you're weak. Big deal. It's a mercy seat. And through that mercy seat, you can pass beyond the cherub that holds you out and become a part of the cherub that's part of the seat. That's why there's two positions of cherubs there. You see that? One to get in, the other to become a part of. The twofold work of the Holy Spirit. When you go through the blood, you now have the right to become a part of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the mercy seat. Whatever this world gets, folks, is based upon the mercy seat. You are the only mercy this world has. Hang on that one for a while. And the only way mercy can be seen is through the four faces of the Christ of the four Gospels. Father, thank you for this message tonight. Thank you, Father, for the cherubim of glory that you've laid at our feet to share with us your will for the indwelling and for the tabernacle. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take this message and burn it into the heart of every believer and to everyone that hears this tape, that we will become charged and flooded with your light as we realize we really are going to win. We really are going to make it. We really are programmed to be winners. I have a right to live. I have a right to happiness. I have a right to health. I have a right to prosper. I have a right to live in peace in my own home. And I began to fight for it. I began to put my foot down, claim the land that belongs to me. Father, we take authority over the works of the devil that you came to destroy. And we say to you, Satan, you have no right to cross the bloodline You cannot cross the veil. You cannot get through the cherubim. You cannot come without blood. You therefore have no right to touch our lives. For our lives are covered by the blood of the Lamb. We are redeemed. We therefore claim healing tonight. Restoration tonight. Renewal tonight. We claim restoration tonight. For everyone in the sound of my voice, 
that right now I loose you from every infirmity. I loose you from every spirit that would hold you in bondage. I loose every infirmity upon your life. I loose every weapon formed against you. And I command you, loosed and set free in the name of Yahweh, Yeshua, HaMashiach. So be it. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.